everyone, hello and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. I'm Laura and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleague Sarah. During the webinar you'll be able to hear our speaker Juliet and to, hit, to see her slides but you won't be able to see Juliet herself. You won't need a microphone. If you want to ask a question please just use the chat box and I'll make sure to ask Juliet at the end of her presentation um, if we have time for the, for the question and answer session. The recording of today's webinar will be on our blog and on YouTube next week. You will be able to download your certificate for attending the webinar from a link that will appear on the screen towards the end of the webinar too. So I'm very pleased to welcome Juliet Starbuck as this afternoon's presenter. Juliet is a passionate and accomplished educational psychologist, trainer and consultant. She supports teachers and senior school staff to cope with the daily challenges of the classroom. She speaks at conferences and runs workshops on topics such as parenting, restorative justice, neuroscience, motivation, and therapeutic communication. She's particularly interested in helping teachers and parents to help their students to be ready to learn. Juliet's also an academic and professional tutor on the doctoral course in educational and child psychology at University College London. So thank you, Juliet, for being with us and over to you. Brilliant. Got some responses. OK, so I will. Um, oh, there's no sound. Uh, I'll just check about my microphone. No, it should be OK. Can people hear me? Not very good quality. OK, I will try and speak as clearly and as loudly as I can. So thank you so much for that introduction. Um, no one surprises me when I hear what I, uh, what I do and what I've done, um, but I hope that I can bring that experience and my knowledge uh, to help you all in your roles uh, in, uh, with teaching, and particularly with supporting the, uh, the adolescent and their learning. Um, so I aim to do uh, that through our hour together today and I've kind of tried to describe those aims as you can see on the slide. I want to develop your understanding of the adolescent brain and I would like to um, help you to use this knowledge to help the adolescents in your classrooms um, to learn better if, if I can and say that. So in order to meet those aims, we're going to do all the things that are on this slide, these objectives. We're going to look at the impact of changes in the brain on behaviour and thinking. We're going to look at social influence. We're going to think a little bit about motivation. Um, and we're going to think about how you can use these ideas to support the students that you teach. And what I would suggest is that you return to these objectives at the end of the session or when you might look at these slides again, which I hope you will, and to think, am I now able to do these things? How could I do these things in my context, in my particular setting? Okay, so... Uh, Neuroscience is, there are two definitions here, um, and the both are equally as helpful, I think, but um, I particularly like the second one, which it is the study of the ways in which the brain learns and remembers. I like that because it links very much to your roles um, as educators, as teachers. Um, so, more specifically, I have a defini definition of educational neuroscience, um, and that builds on those same ideas we've just touched on, but it is bringing in the idea of education, it's bringing the idea of, of the role of the teacher, the role of the environment, um, the way that individuals may learn, um, and, but what is important is it's emphasising the scientific and, rig scientific and rigorous nature of, of studying these issues, um, which is something we will pick up later 
uh, when we look a little bit at neuro myths. Okay, so how is it that, or why is it that this field is becoming of greater interest? And it's very much to do with the technology. So you'll see on your screen a picture of a MRI scanner. Some of you may have been in one of these. So the person is slid into the scanner and a picture can be taken of their brain. And we have two types of images. One is the structural, which you see there on your screen, where we look at the bits and pieces of the brain. And the other is a functional image where we look at how those bits and pieces work. Perhaps when the person is asked to think of something, maybe think of something exciting, think of something sad, or maybe uh, problem solve. Different parts of the brain will light up and we can see what what is happening and it's becoming so much more accessible so the next slide looks more specifically at the structural changes and in particular it looks at the gray matter and the white matter which may be something you have heard of um, and what these are, there's a grey matter. Sometimes we tell people to use their grey matter when they are thinking. And that is our cell bodies and our connections. The white matter is our long fibres and it's the bits that carry the, cell, the bodies and which carry a, a link between the bodies and carry the signals. Now, why does this matter? In the brain, these images have shown us that there is a lot of, of stuff going on with the grey matter. When a baby is born, there's more grey matter than it needs. So a preening process begins at 18 months where we decrease the amount of grey matter. That happens and sometimes we think about children um, going through the terrible twos when they are just really difficult to manage. And of course, um, that might remind you of your adolescents, your teenagers, because, and that is no coincidence, and this is because the pruning also happens in adolescence when a young person to gets to be a teenager. At this point, I will just say that the definition of adolescents and teenagers I will use interchangeably as the same thing. There is debate about when it starts, adolescence starts, and when it finishes, but for our purposes we will think of it as when puberty starts, so when the body starts to change um, because of hormonal changes and the, the road to an, uh, becoming an adult begins. So at this time all this pruning happens, and a lot of it happens in the frontal lobes, the part of the brain which is very, very crucial when we're thinking about thinking and planning and indeed learning. That is just a slide which reminds you that we've got change going on between four years and 21 years, but as I've said, the greatest changes happen when someone is about 18 months old and when they are in adolescence. So what else is happening or what, what is happening? We know that the brain responds to environmental demands. It's plastic, plasticity. It can change. And this can be good because... Um, the, it means that there is always an opportunity for learning and there is always opportunity to overcome challenge. We know that the adolescent brain carries on well past puberty. Um, and 
that might be up to, when we saw an earlier slide, up to about 21. They, it, some changes can occur for longer. In terms of when adolescence ends, uh, that should be when the biological changes stop happening and the person moves into adulthood. There are stages called sort of pre-adulthood, which possibly have a more societal explanation at this stage. We also know that hormones come into the picture, as I've said, this sort starts adolescence going. And we have to take account of those, particularly the impact on emotional development. I'll say more about those shortly. We also know that teenagers and adolescents have an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. This may explain their unstable behavior. We will look at this further in a moment. What is really key in our understanding of teenagers and ad adolescents is that they are at a unique time when we have emotional immaturity, but we also have great high cognitive potential, great opportunities for learning, great opportunities for seeking and overcoming challenge. It's a really exciting time, but it can be a difficult time if we don't support young people to get through this process, particularly in, ter in terms of their learning. So hopefully that is something you can help them to do a little more. Okay, so in this slide, we're seeing a little bit more about the medial prefrontal cortex and the impact of this um, and how it works in, in, in adolescence. And you will see on the slide, there are a number of social behaviors or social ways of thinking that are affected because of changes going on in the prefrontal cortex. And if you cast your, if you have a look at those, you might start to think, well, how does that affect my teaching? How does that affect my interactions with the young people? And one point that I think is key to make is that some of us, when we teach, tend to use humor, which is fine. But sometimes we also use maybe sarcasm or we tease our young people. And it might be something you want to reflect on in your own practice because it could be that some of our young people are not interpreting your humour in the way that you intend it. And they might not understand that you have their goodwill at heart. So the, um, the changes in the brain can impact on how you teach. The other areas, there are other areas where um, the prefrontal cortex is involved. And because of the changes in adolescence, we have challenges or difficulties in the areas that you can see on the slide. And again, if you look at those, you might start to think, whoa, how is that going to affect my teaching and my interaction with my pupils? but also their interaction with the tasks and the challenges and the teaching that you set for them. So we might see multitasking, decision making. Will they make the decision to do the study you've set them or will they make the decision to go out with their friends? Um, are they self-aware? Maybe if they are, I don't know, sitting in a rude kind of way in the um, classroom, maybe appearing not to pay attention. They may not be aware of that in themselves and they may not be aware of how that affects you and others. Okay, so what can we do? Brain research is showing us that a nurturing environment is important and is help, will help um, young people to learn. So. That is, there are many, many ways that that can be achieved. Um, but at the bottom of the slide, I've pointed out some of the areas where we could quite easily, perhaps, maybe working with families, we could make things better for the young people that we're trying to teach. 
So you can see nutrition, physical exercise, the nature of the opportunities and interactions that the young people have. If they're spending all of their time sitting in front of a computer and they're not interacting with other people, apart from when they come to your lessons, and then they're not interacting with anybody, how will that impact on their learning? At the bottom of this slide, there is a very key environmental factor, which is sleep. And there is more and more research and concern developing in this area. But one thing we do know is that young people typically prefer, because of what's happening in their brain, to go to bed later and get up later. And sometimes this doesn't fit with the way our timetables are structured. So you might want to think about how much of the most, most important information you are delivering at the start of the day compared with other times of the day. What else can we do? We can think about the instructional methods that we use in, because it impacts on the neural pathways which are developed. Remember I talked about the plasticity of the brain. And when you are teaching, this is what you are affecting. You are affecting the brain. So you might think about drill learning versus strategic learning. Evidence suggests that strategic learning, where you include rich detail, is better than drill learning. However, that might depend on what you're trying to achieve. But do be uh, aware of it when you're planning your teaching approaches. The value of giving feedback, specific feedback about the process of learning is key. The value of eliciting ideas from the students themselves rather than just telling them is key. The second point there says that the brain is biologically primed to learn language right from the early start of life. And so that could be exploited. But of course, we are working with adolescents. So rather than thinking, oh, well, it's too late, we must remember the plasticity that we've talked about and that it is never too late to learn. This is just a reminder that it's about nature and about nurture, and that when we're looking at brain science, we mustn't just think, oh, it's fixed. The brain shows us pictures and images, and it's telling us this is large, this is small, so it's done. It's the interaction between the both which is key. Another area which it is impossible to ignore when we're talking about teenagers, adolescents, when we're talking about behavior, we're talking about learning, are, are hormones. And this is a really new area of research, looking at the interaction between hormones, the way that young people think, and between the brain. New area of science, but there is a suggestion that if we can help teenagers to think in different ways about themselves, then the impact of the hormones doesn't necessarily have to be as negative as we sometimes think it is, i.e., oh, well, they can't help it. They're just going to be moody. They're just going to be aggressive. There are things that we can do. OK, so here is a slide which I would welcome particular comment on. We have five um, well-known, often used um, statements, ideas linked to brain science, to neuropsychology. So the first one is that there is a visual or a sound or, or a touch type of learning. And we tend to say, oh, yes, I learn better visually, or I learn better when I hear what I'm told. Who thinks that that is completely true? And there's no question linked to those ideas. 
True? True? Untrue? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Angela, Susan, France, James. We're getting we're getting some opinions. First of all, I admire your uh, your courage for responding. That's excellent. Well, in fact, even though we have said this time and time again, the evidence through brain science for this is weak, and it isn't something that we can say is a fact, because the key issue is how we interpret the, um, the, the information which is coming into us, and they simply don't know enough about the relationship between these, uh, the stimulus and, the, um, and this interpretation. So as Franz says, learning styles are not proven. So the answer as a teacher is probably to use a range, which is probably what you do do. Um, th so this is about proof. So it is. It is. It, it has not been proven. Thank you for your responses. Who believes that we definitely have? Oh, I use my left brain. A left brain dominance and a right brain dominance. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Yes. Good. Okay, again, lots of responses. Thank you, and quite a mix. So we're having some yeses, some noes, some not sures. And again, um, this is a very well um, accepted notion, but in fact, um, the research with the brain site, with the, the new methods of looking at the brain, is beginning to tell us that actually it is an intimate working relationship, and that anybody who's successful and would say, I'm good at using my right brain and that means I am XYZ will be using both parts of the brain and it's the capacity to use them in an intimate working relationship. Okay, we're going to be a little bit short of time so I won't go through all of these um, but I just want to address number four. By the way, they're all um, unproven, they're all myths. But number four, critical periods in time exist where most of a child's learning takes place. As I said earlier with language, there are times when a child will learn better or a young person will learn better. So for example, um, emotions and speech sounds can be learned better when a child is younger. But it's a, it's more, it is rather than it's critical, it's more that they are more sensitive times, better times. But there are other um, bits, parts of learning which can be learnt at any point, including vocabulary, for example. So the key message is that um, we can learn at any time, and it's about finding the best way to help an individual to do that. Okay, thank you for your contributions there. Um, so we're thinking about um, the impact of, of the brain and the changes in the brain on the way that young people behave. These young people who might be in your classrooms, who you want to have focused on learning your subject, and yet they just don't seem to be motivated or bothered, or they just don't um, hear what it is you're saying. They also might appear rude and challenging. So um, adolescents do struggle to stop themselves saying and doing things without thinking. They, it says here that they struggle to, to work out the chance of something going wrong. That's a little bit simplistic. They can do that, but they are affected by their peers in the way that they do that. Um, and what we do know is that adolescents tend to make decisions dependent on the immediate, the immediate social reward that they will get from whatever it, it is that they will do. Um, and the fourth point is that they do uh, find it hard to think about the consequences of their actions, even when you've told them as an adult many, many, many times. And it can be very frustrating. But because of these things, we have to be very, very careful of keeping our young people safe, although not d stopping them from exploring and taking risks at times. Okay, so what is a social reward? What is this thing that is much more important to them 
than arguably we are, um, arguably your subject is. So it's any event in a social context that brings um, or elicits learning, sorry for the error there, um, elicits learning, elicits approach behavior and produces positive emotions. So motivation might well sum up um, the, um, the significance of social reward. What are our young people motivated by? And so that comes into the second point, which it is, it, it, it's about the motivational and pleasurable aspect of interacting with others. And the problem for us as teachers can be that others and social events are more appealing than our topic. Okay, so other impact, the um, impacts of brain changes on adolescent behavior can be seen in the way that young people perceive themselves. So it addresses issues of their identity and something that we could often see is it raises issues around self-consciousness. And the second quotation there reminds us that um, acceptance and rejection by peers becomes extremely important to the young people that we're working with. So when we're thinking about how to teach, and I will come to this in more detail towards the end, we do need to be careful about asking young people to do things publicly, asking young people to answer questions when they don't know the answer and maybe they haven't volunteered or put their hand up. So we should always be seeking ways to get them to perhaps work in pairs or small groups um, and to give their um, responses to our questions privately. Um, and so we must be aware that it could be an extremely painful process for our young people sitting in a classroom, even if we think we have made it a safe and comfortable environment. So we're going to look at a bit of research now around um, adolescence and risk taking. Um, obviously that's relevant to them in every sense and when they're out and about, but it's also relevant in lessons because it emphasizes the value that young people place on the opinions and views of other young people. So these researchers took three groups, a group of adolescents 13 to 16, young adults 17 to 24, adults 25 to 40, and they put them in a driving simulator and they saw a picture like that. On the whole, the adult saw a picture that you see on the left-hand side of the slide, and a lot of the young people saw a picture that you see on the right-hand side of the slide. And that is because the young people took more risks. However, only when being watched by friends. So some of the young people were put in, and the adults were put in a condition when they were playing alone. And then they repeated, but they were observed. And what was found, sorry, I'm just going back, was that the adolescents were more affected by the presence of their peers, but even though the presence of peers might have resulted in negative outcomes for the young people, they still want to spend more time with their peers. Um, I have a slide which doesn't seem to be coming up, um, which shows you that the adolescents can make sensible decisions, but it's when the peers are present those sensible decisions just go out of the window. It's not that they don't know, it's not that they can't assess risk, it's just that they ignore their own positive and sensible thoughts when other young people are present. And the reasons that they do this include reward value, fear of social exclusion, 
and the value of other rewards. So the um, and the prefrontal cortex, which we talked about earlier, um, plays a part in this process, particularly around the fear of social exclusion. And what have they, they have shown through the brain science studies is that the prefrontal cortex is helpful in coping with negative evaluation from peers. And, and, and it, re it reduces the, the, the distress that we feel when we are negatively evaluated. That evaluation could include being rejected or thinking that we are being rejected. In terms of um, the, so adults, as that part of the brain develops, they might be more, they might be upset by something somebody says or by knowing that they're being criticized or feeling that they're being ostracized, but they, um, they, um, they can deal with it much better. The reward value is to do with how important um, being with the um, others or taking the risk is and it will be at its highest if it's a social reward. And that's emphasized in this slide where social stimuli have more heightened value at this stage. So risk perception is another area of research. Quite a lot of information on this slide, which I won't cover all of it. But the key point here is that when you're asked to make a rating of risk with various scenarios, people listen to what others have said. And on the whole, most age groups try and match their views. So they will change their views to match other adults' views or to match adults' views. So even older adolescents will change their view to match the wisdom of adults apart from younger adolescents, so that's 12 to 14 year olds, who will do what older adolescents set, tell them. So this is key in terms of the influence of older adolescents on those younger adolescents. This next slide is linked to performance, which is relevant to you guys, perhaps in terms of learning and testing. And adults are not affected by um, um, uh, they're positively affected by having an audience when it's a simple task that they can manage, but if it's a more complex task that they have less confidence about, they won't do so well. Older and younger adolescents are always affected ne negatively or on the whole by the influence of peers and people watching them. That could link to the self-consciousness. So in terms of hormones again, just an interesting little gender difference which is that actually having increased testosterone, a small amount, could arguably be better for girls because it helps them adopt moderated, more male behavior in our arguably uh, a world where risk taking can benefit them. But that's just an area. So perhaps in money making, taking risks to make more money, to speculate, that kind of thing. Diamond has looked at the impact of um, the um, adolescent brain changes on the cognitive performance, um, as is outlined there. And we then have a little bit more about rewards, picking up on some of the themes um, that we've discussed earlier. And we can see here that the idea of novel tasks and new experiences is exciting to young people. Now, whilst that can be negative, it can also be used in teaching to stimulate new ideas and to create motivation. Um, and we, we have a very flexible and exciting a brain ready to learn um, because of all the things we've talked about, which can be exploited and can be seen as an opportunity. This slide just reminds us that research is, is new, but we're looking at areas of the brain that are, limit, uh, are related to self-control. And self-regulation, self-control is a key challenge when working with adolescents and indeed with a range of other children. Um, but there's a lot of work to go there. Now, in terms of what we can do, I've just presented a number of ideas which you could perhaps explore in your own time that can benefit uh, young people. But it's about awareness in many ways. It's about saying we have these difficulties for 
reasons that we are learning more about, but what can we do about it? So for example, we can actually say in a safe and respectful way to teenagers, you're not very good at reading emotions, and that's why you're in arguments, that's why you come into my lessons with misunderstandings, and you could explicitly make them aware and get them to teach. Um, teaching cognitive control skills might include mind mapping, using timetables, um, helping people to, you know, let, un telling your young people you understand it's difficult, getting them to arrive places a bit earlier, trying to teach them strategies to help them manage. So very briefly, I've got four further ideas here. Procedural justice theory is about is recognizing that young people really do need to have a chance to have their say in terms of justice and in terms of what's going on, wrongdoing, how things are organized, how things are set up. So seeking opportunities to give them that chance is key. And that can be done through restorative justice, which is a means of helping, uh, of dealing with wrongdoing and conflict in, in schools and in society about which I could talk to you forever, but we only have a couple of seconds. Belonging and connectedness. It's, I've seen some of you have commented on the importance of just saying a positive comment. When a young person comes into the class, just use their name. Just ask about something they did, maybe played in a football match yesterday. If they've been off sick, just make them aware that you knew and welcome them back, ask them if they're okay. A single comment will make them think, wow that I matter, I belong, I'm connected to you and to the institution. Classroom culture, choice of ta tasks, fantasy autonomy, not telling people what to do all the time, but giving them choices. Right, we could do this first, then we could do that. Get them to play cr characters, act out roles. It might, they might think it's childish, but it's not. It gives them a chance to explore without being too concerned about, about their image. If somebody wants to sit quietly in the corner and not take part, fine, that's okay. It, it, respect their emotions. Give them decisions about how they do things. Do they want to do a PowerPoint? Do they want to do it in pen and paper? Do they want to do it in a group? Do they want to do it on their own? There's lots of ways you can create a much more creative classroom. And this links very much to motivation, which again is another topic we've touched on but which we could develop. And I would just implore you, give specific feedback to our young people. Don't just say, well done. Tell them why they've done well and praise their effort. It's tough for them sometimes. Um, thank you very much for, your, for, for listening. And I understand I need to uh, draw this to a close now. Thanks so much, Juliet. That was great. And thanks for, for your calmness and smooth delivery in the technical <laughs> issues that we had earlier. Um, apologies, everyone, for that again. Uh, but I think we can all agree that we've had a very informative and interesting um, session. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Please type in the chat box. We've just got one or two minutes for, for um, questions. Uh, I can see... So Franz has asked um, Juliet how um, the, the risk-taking behaviour, how is that actually explained by the brain development or do we not really know yet? Um, the, um, it, 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 we, they do know quite a lot um, the, 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 through, through their, um, their studies. I think it's um, because at this stage, the key part of it that we do know is that the changes in the brain and the societal changes make the importance of others um, greater. So they will take risks in the presence of others because they perceive that that is um, a socially um, Desire, desirable that 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 will um, connect them more to to their peers. But there are in my, there are unanswered questions. Um, there are papers which um, France could read that would um, which I've made reference to in in the um, in the text. But um, but it's also that because of all the pro it, it's it's all the links between not being able to um, um, control oneself. 
um, and to plan one's own actions, it just seems that the, the influence of the peers becomes, becomes greater because young people can judge the risk. They do know that it's risky, but they just don't listen to themselves, if that makes sense. So the, the, the social aspects much more important. Yeah, yeah, but do check the references. Thank you, Franz. Thank you. And just want time for just one more. Um, James has asked, uh, how much, how much of the inability to socially interact and read emotions is is related to the, the sort of prevalence of screen time for teenagers? Huh. I um, yes, I I don't know. I'm not an expert in that regard, other than bits and pieces that I have read. I again, I think it's still a new area of research. Uh, I guess um, one of my thesis tutees have done has done a study on that kind of thing recently, and it is it is that um, th one of the areas is that they um, how we define social interaction, I suppose, which um, may well be that they're very good at interacting, not you know in virtual worlds, um, but um, yeah, I don't I haven't read any studies that have made the correlation clear between. Um, lack of practice, if you like, and actual ability. Um, I, I imagine it's something that's been closely looked into. So, sorry, that's a waffly answer, but uh, that's as good as I, I can give you at the moment. Brilliant. But it, it makes intuitive yeah, sense, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for then. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us, Juliet. That was really, really interesting. And thanks to everyone um, from all over the world for joining us. We've had a really, really great attendance and um, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, so I'm afraid, uh, don't forget to check our events page for details of any more upcoming webinars, which you can visit at cambridge.org slash ELT events. The recording of today's webinar will be live on our blog and our YouTube channel by next week. And please don't forget to download your certificate from the link that's currently on screen now. Uh, for any of you who are having problems downloading that on, on your mobile phones, we will also email the, um, the certificate over um, later on, but it may take a week or two. So thanks everybody and thank you Juliet again um, and hopefully look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. <laughs>